Flight 164 departed Tampa, Florida, mid-afternoon. Its flight path took it into northern skies, where at 7.43 p.m. local time, it landed at John F. Kennedy International Airport, New York. After routine safety checks and refueling, November 310 Echo Alpha was cleared by the dispatcher for a 9 p.m. departure outbound. At 9.20 p.m., clearance was given to the L-1011 for takeoff. As it thundered down the New York runway, it lifted 185 tons of new aircraft, fuel, 160 passengers and crew, and their belongings into the night sky. The L-1011's flight path took it south over Norfolk, Virginia, where it followed Jet Airways 79 to Wilmington, North Carolina, whereafter it headed over the coast. When the giant Whisper Liner passed east of Jacksonville, Florida, it was some 150 miles out at sea. Upon reaching an invisible checkpoint known as Barracuda, the aircraft stored flight plan turned the TriStar to its right to begin its slow descent towards and over West Palm Beach, Florida, then south to Miami International Airport for a landing on runway 9. November 310's flight crew were all very experienced officers. Fifty-five years old Captain Robert Albin Loft had been flying for thirty-two years and had been with the airline since his very early days. Out of the airline's four thousand pilots, he was ranked fiftieth in terms of seniority. Albert John Stockstill was the first officer and co-pilot. He was thirty-nine years old and a former Air Force pilot. He was a native of Louisiana who now lived in Miami. Bert Stockstill had more flying hours on the new L-1011s than his captain. Fifty-one-year-old Donald Louis Repo was the flight engineer and third officer. He had been employed by the airline for almost half of his life, some twenty-five years. He was a native of Massachusetts, now living in Miami. Also on the flight deck, occupying jump seats, were two more experienced officers, Warren Terry, a co-pilot, and Angelo Donadeo, a maintenance specialist. Both men were dead-heading back to Miami, dead-heading being airline slang for hitching a free ride to return from a duty assignment. Welcome to Miami. The temperature's in the low 70s, and it's a beautiful night out there today. Go ahead and throw them out. There were over 170 souls on board Eastern Airlines Flight 401 that night, including the crew. Most were heading home after spending Christmas with their families. Many were glad to escape the bitter harsh cold weather of New York for the warmer climate of Miami. As the flight crew commenced their pre-landing checks, a problem was discovered at 23 hours 33 minutes. Radar, up, off, hydraulic panels checked, 35-33, gear down. Bird, is that handling? No nose gear. The landing gear lights indicated a possible failure of the nose wheel. This presented a dilemma to Captain Loft. Had the bulb failed, or had the nose wheel? Or could it be both? After repeatedly raising and lowering the undercarriage, the light still refused to illuminate. At 23 hours 34 minutes, Captain Loft contacted Miami Center, advising them of their problem. Uh, tower, this is Eastern uh, 401. Looks like we're going to have to circle. We don't have a light on our nose gear yet. Eastern 401 Heavy, Roger. Pull up, climb straight ahead to 2,000. Go back to approach control, 128.6. After instructing the first officer to switch on the autopilot and set it for 2,000 feet at 23 hours 36 minutes, both pilots tried to remove the bulb housing. Captain Loft found it difficult to reach. After successfully accomplishing its removal by the first officer, it was inserted back into position. 
it still refused to work. Captain Loft then turned and instructed the flight engineer to go down into the hell hole to check that the nose wheel was down and lined up. This was just prior to the aircraft losing altitude. So what caused the aircraft to descend? Hey, hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel is down. Did you see what happened there? Did you notice that as the captain turned, his arm caught the control wheel? Speculation is that his arm caught the control wheel with just sufficient pressure to disengage the altitude control of the autopilot. Let's watch it again. Hey, hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel is down. This is believed to be the reason why Flight 401 lost height. An alarm did sound in the flight deck at the engineer's console. But with all three pilots preoccupied with the landing light situation, none of them heard it. By the time their loss of altitude was noticed, it was too late. It is now 23, 42 hours. Something to the altitude? What? We're still at 2,000, right? Hey, hey, what's happening here? Eastern 401 crashed into the Everglades at 227 miles per hour. Initially, 77 people survived the crash. 99 lost their lives. Another two would die in hospital, one of which was Dom Repo, the flight engineer. Captain Loft died at the scene soon after the crash. It is the world's first jumbo jet disaster. It was the quick thinking actions of one man that helped save so many survivors. Bob Marquis was in the Everglades that night. He watched 401 soar overhead and saw its fireball as it impacted the soft earth. He raced his airboat as fast as he could to the site, which was about 15 minutes away. He waded into the swamp and set about helping people. As jet fuel burned into his legs, he continued to help. One man still strapped into his seat was about to drown as his head started to go under water. Bob found him and lifted the man in his seat until sitting up and safe. He then carried on helping others.